So I came across this YouTube channel the other day, totally not because of this video or anything. The name of the channel is One Reality, set up by One Reality Ministries, not too surprising there. So I'm going to refer to this YouTuber by his channel name, so bear that in mind throughout this video. Now I'm not one to want to jump to any conclusions. I first thought maybe this was parody or maybe sarcasm until I checked out the other videos on One Reality's channel and unfortunately it's filled with outright heresy and misrepresentations of what scripture teaches. Now I do want to say at the offset that even false teachers or in this case people who have been taught falsely get some things right from time to time but that does not excuse the rest of what comes from these types of videos that One Reality is putting out on his YouTube channel. Let's be clear, I'm not doing what One Reality did in his video accusing Blimey Cow of being fake Christians. What I am doing however is attempting to expose the false theology that's hiding behind his hermeneutic and respectfully call him to repentance as I've done in previous videos directed towards the vigilant Christian. And yes, I will be sending this video to One Reality to see if he will respond. So first I want to analyze his YouTube channel, just look at the channel itself and see what kind of information we can gather simply from first impressions. Then I want to dive into a specific video that encompasses what I feel is wrong with the overall theology of the channel. So be warned, this video may be a little bit longer than what we're used to, but I feel like it's worth the time and to truly dive in and examine some of the stuff that is said on some of these YouTube videos. Again, I want to stress before we start that I am not making claims based on fallacious accusations like he tends to do. Instead, I'm going to examine what he himself personally has taught. So with that being said, uh, let's get started. Number one, everything. Okay, let's get to that first impression, shall we? Here is One Reality's videos. You can see he's uh, still active pretty recently. And, um, oh, the devil loves your church. What a great title that is. And as you can see, I've watched this video. This is the one we're actually going to be critiquing here soon. I've already watched a few of his videos to kind of get an idea of the channel. Oh, look, our first bit of heresy. Faith alone, false teaching exposed. Ooh, yeah, um, the faith alone, you know, uh, you know, Ephesians 2, you know, that, that doesn't matter. Oh, a Christian's relationship with movies and TV. I guess I'm not a Christian anymore. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. Uh, Ted Cruz, is he a Christian? I don't know. Let's examine his fruit because apparently that's what one reality likes to do. A lot of fruit checking. Uh, that That's going to come in handy in a second. But he's got some more of these type of fruit checking videos. Uh, let's see. Test your Christianity. Oh, your church is probably a satanic one and you need to repent. Yeah, stop doing that stuff. Okay, let's load a little bit more. And okay. Oh, look at this. Keep God's laws equals eternal life. Yeah. yeah. Ephesians 2 comes to mind with that also, but you know, who am I to say? An important side note to understand when we see things like this on One Reality's channel is that we have to understand what Jesus means when he commands us to examine a person's fruit. When you know people by their fruit, it means you know what they teach and whether it lines up with the truth of what's taught in scripture and what we're called to believe as Christians. This is going to be extremely important to understand with the context of Matthew 7 as this is one of the foundational texts for what is known as Christian perfectionism. Christian perfectionism is the the doctrine that one reality promotes on his channel and it's a heresy in the church which teaches that Christians can and should be perfected in this life. Meaning that one day if the Christian tries hard enough they will no longer be an active sinner but will completely and totally be perfected before their death. Sorry Jesus, guess you were wrong about that whole daily repentance thing you taught us to pray for. Oh and one day I won't even need your cross either but thanks for trying. Christian perfectionists tend to use their theology to try to fruit check other Christians and make the claim that certain Christians are not really Christians even though they've been baptized and confess the truth of scripture. But fruit checking as a practice falls apart when you realize that Jesus is mainly focusing on the teaching as being someone's manifested fruit. And of course I shouldn't have to explain that what you believe will inform how you live. There's just no two ways about it. You either believe what you say you believe or you don't and your actions do speak louder than words often Time. I hate that I have to clarify that, but it will help going forward as we deal with this form of Christian perfectionism found on One Reality's YouTube channel. One Reality already has a series of videos where he teaches Christians how to become sinless while simultaneously ripping Bible verses out of context in order to prove his false theology. Part 2 
so what does God think of imperfect Christians? Well, or Christians who sin. What, is, what, are, what does God think of those people? If we look at 1 John 2, 4, we can see clearly what God thinks of imperfect Christians or Christians who sin. When he says, he who says that I know him, referring to God, does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in them. So clearly, God does not see imperfect Christians in a good way. One reality, I hope you're listening because right off the bat, the first problem I see is that you don't like reading scripture in context or being honest with your audience because that's not what scripture teaches in its proper context. Just like I can take your words out of context if I wanted to. But don't take my word for it. Let's read 1 John chapters 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. Bearing in mind we're reading a lot of scripture, but we need to get the context of what the Apostle John is actually saying. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and his Son Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you, so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. I can see a few parts of this passage that completely debunks Christian perfectionism, seeing as how the Apostle John is telling them they will sin when they sin to seek Christ. And if we sin say we have no sin we make God out to be a liar being a liar and the truth not in you is not a good thing when people claim to know God and don't keep his commands being imperfect they don't really know God they really are not Christians they really are not Saved. One reality, do you not realize that if you look at both parts of this text, which refer to the truth not being in someone, the first passage actually condemned your perfectionist theology because it's literally saying, if we say we have no sin, we make God out to be a liar. Bearing in mind that when we read these passages in context, the apostle is speaking to the Christian church. He is speaking to people who are already Christians, meaning that they are not perfect and should not assume they would be perfect any time in the future. And yes, they are professing Christian. Yes, a Christian is to forsake sin and not revel in it. And that's what the Apostle John is calling us to do. Any other interpretation causes John to contradict himself and make him look like an idiot. A lot of people like to claim with 1 John 2, 4, well, all it says is, um, you don't know God. This says nothing about salvation, but then when we look, no, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I believe verses 7 through 9, it talks about how the wrath of God is going to be upon those who don't know God when God comes back in, in taking vengeance in flaming fire. I believe that's verse 8 in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, that he's going to destroy those who don't know God. So if you do not know God, you are not a Christian. The wrath of God is upon you. I find it completely absurd that you would lump baptized professing Christians into the same category as those who are going to experience the wrath of God because of their rejection of the gospel and punishment for their sins. You have to really stretch in order to make two different passages of scripture talk about the same individuals when they clearly don't. Your condemnation of professing Christians has now become a clear breaking of the eighth commandment to not bear false witness against your neighbor. And as a side note, please don't correct me on the numbering of the commandments. I'm a Lutheran and we number them differently, aka the right way, than most of broader evangelicalism. Christ has not taken perfect Christians lightly. We must be holy. So if you are an imperfect Christian, as in you are still sinning, you need to repent. You need to turn from your sins. You need to actually follow what the word of God says. Because there's not going to be Christians going to heaven who have broken God's law. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You don't know God. God's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. 
as Matthew 7 says. I would love to hear the biblical definition of what it means to be holy and what it means to live a holy life rather than having you teach me what it means because obviously you can't get the context of the scriptures you quote right. <laughs> You have to use mental gymnastics in order to condemn other Christians while you yourself remain immune. Either way, now you just broke the second commandment to not take the Lord's name in vain. By confessing and teaching this false doctrine, you are blaspheming and telling lies about God. Sorry for being so blunt, but it is the truth. You don't know God. God's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity as Matthew 7 says. That's it, folks. The Bible is going to have to go to a chiropractor. I would hate to see the bill the scriptures are going to have to receive after all of this twisting. But seriously, this type of mishandling of scripture just to suit your own theology means I would have to go as far as to say that this breaks the first commandment. Thou shalt not have any other gods before. Yeah, that one, the God. One reality, you are so committed to this theology rather than what scripture says that you're willing to take passages out of context and ignore completely what is actually going on in the text. And this is why you have put your pet theology in the place of God himself. What you need to do is you need to get right with God, you need to repent, you change your mind, you stop living for yourself and your selfish desires, and you start following what the word of God says. So we need to repent, we need to turn from our sins and stop doing them and start following what the Word of God says, reading it and obeying it daily. Don't be those Christians who are breaking God's law. Follow God's Word today. I can agree with that sentiment in some way, but because it's so closely tied to false doctrine, I can't affirm it. The irony of this is that those who hold to Christian perfectionism often like to lord their authority over people by causing them to question their own salvation. Ironically, something that Jesus tells us not to do. So in reality, I'm begging you to heed your own words and repent for all of the things that you believe that are clearly in contradiction of sacred scripture. Stop stealing people's baptismal joy away from them by putting them back under the yoke and burden of the law and leading them away from the gospel truth that Jesus died to deliver to them. I don't mind calling people to repentance if it's needed, and in this case, I feel it is most definitely needed to call you to repentance respectfully. If you're going to claim to be a Christian and contend for the truth, stop taking God's word out of context in order to preach a false doctrine. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen.